Good afternoon. Does everybody have lunch? <clears throat> um, our speaker today is Dr. Nathan Wolf. Dr. Wolf holds the Laurie Loki Visiting Professorship in Human Biology at Stanford University. He received his doctorate in immunology and infectious diseases from Harvard in 1998. He has been the recipient of a Fulbright, Fulbright Scholarship, Fulbright Fellowship, the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, and the National Geographic Emerging Explorer Award. Dr. Wolf's research aims to chart the diversity of microbial life on Earth and combines methods from molecular virology, ecology, evolutionary biology, and anthropology. Among his major findings include the first evidence of the natural transit transmission of retroviruses from non-human primates to humans. Dr. Wolf founded and directs the Global Viral Forecasting Initiative, which is a pandemic early warning system which monitors the spillover of novel infectious agents from animals into humans. The initiative was recently awarded an $11 million, $11 million from Google and Skoll Foundations. Um, it coordinates activities of over 100 scientists and staff from countries all around the world. And I'll stop there and let Dr. Wolf explain the rest of his work. Dr. Wolf? Thank you very much. Um, it's a wonderful pleasure to be able to speak with you today. Please, we'll make this informal. Uh, tackle me, stop me. If you have any questions, if I say something that's not clear, let me know. And I'm happy to take some time to chat about whatever your questions may be. This is really sort of for you and to tell you a little bit about uh, my world and what we do. So uh, I'd ask you to just start by thinking for a moment about the beginnings of the AIDS pandemic. Okay, And I think this is something obviously of importance to all of us. Most of you and most people will actually, uh, when they think about the beginnings of the AIDS pandemic, they'll think to the 1980s, okay, times when we started finding out people like Magic Johnson were infected. In fact, everything we know about the global AIDS pandemic is that HIV is a virus that entered into human populations probably as early as the late 19th century, okay, but certainly at the time of this photo, before the Great Depression, HIV existed in hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals in places throughout Central Africa. Okay? And so there's a very fundamental and primary question that you should be asking yourself. Namely, if this is a virus that entered into human populations before the Great Depression, why is it that it took us until 1981 to be able to identify the disease that was caused by this virus? Why is it that it took us until 1984 to be able, be able to identify the virus that caused the disease? Why was it not until 1986 that the President of the United States of America first used the word AIDS? Okay, so what could we have done differently? From my perspective, this was a colossal failure. Okay, 1984, the virus was announced. The, director of, the Deputy Director of Health and, Human, uh, Health and Human Services said within a year we're gonna have a vaccine against HIV, okay? As many of you know, now we're practically 30 years into the pandemic from this, this period where it really spread globally. And arguably, we're not necessarily much closer to an HIV vaccine than we were then. Okay, so what we have is a completely fundamentally different perspective. What we said is that what needs to happen is that we need to try to prevent pandemics. Okay, and here's the logic. If you went to your cardiologist and you said, well, I've got family history of heart disease, I've got high blood pressure, I used to smoke cigarettes. If the answer was, oh, don't worry, we've got wonderful heart surgery, you just hang out, if you get a heart attack, we're going to do open heart surgery, we're going to take care of you, obviously that would be ridiculous. We fully embrace the benefits of individual preventative level care. But when it comes to populations, we're like this sort of fictitious cardiologist. We wait for pandemics like HIV to spread globally by which time they're arguably much too late. And I think that's the HIV-AIDS pandemic has been a perfect illustration of this. Now, if you think HIV is somehow unique in this sense, okay, HIV is a virus that entered into human populations from chimpanzees in Central Africa. But the vast majority of important diseases of humanity are actually diseases of animals. Okay, so we think of these as human phenomena. But if you take a look at influenza, if you think about SARS or Ebola, yellow fever, even diseases like smallpox and malaria originally have origins from animal populations. Okay, so this is an animal phenomenon. And the basic idea of this 
Uh, this is a, a paper I wrote along with Claire Panosian and Jared Diamond in Nature, which was a base, like a major review of the origins of human diseases. And what we found is the vast majority of the major diseases of humanity come from animals. And that also these sort of new bubbling up diseases, things like Ebola and SARS, they also come from animals. And there's this process by which you have diseases in animal reservoirs, and they sort of ping human populations. They're bubbling up into human populations. Okay, and they have many steps that they have to take before they become human adaptive, sort of exclusive agents in human populations. Yet if you look at our global disease control efforts, almost everything is focused right up here. Okay? But the interesting story and the point when these things are still weakly adapted to human populations, the moment when we can still potentially have a major fundamental difference of these things, is this early point. Yet nobody is really focused on this point. So during the last 10 years, we've actually focused right here. Uh, viral chatter is a term uh, coined by my, my mentor, Don Burke. And the basic idea there is just like an intelligence chatter. If we get out there, if we, if we sort of catch these pinging moments, and if we understand the patterns of all these diseases which are entering into human populations at all times, we may actually be able to eventually catch patterns and be able to say, OK, this is a moment where we're catching something important. Okay? And so this was the basic sort of theoretical framework that we entered into our work with. Um, and actually, I spend a good amount of my time working with, with folks like this. this. Okay, so this is a very typical hunter from Central Africa. Uh, these are the kind of folks we work at, right? Because again, we're trying to capture this interface between humans and animals. The point is we want to catch the point at which pandemics are born, ideally to be able to prevent them in the future. And so we work a lot with individuals like this. And one of the things I want you to note about this is just the heavy levels of blood contact that this individual has. Okay, what that means is a tremendous amount of potential for a whole range of microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, the whole full gamut of things to cross over from animals into human populations. This is how we think pandemics are born. This is where we think we need to be studying. And so the basic mission of our objective is to work with these individuals and to establish a global viral monitoring program, okay, to really be able to follow viral chatter, to catch pandemics early, and to be able to sound the alarm, uh, ideally years and years before something like HIV emerges again. Because this is a phenomena. Human populations are incredibly interconnected. These are just going to continue to keep happening. Um, because this is such a, a, an influential crowd, I want to take a moment and talk about something which is related to the work we do, but it's a little bit different. And this is the, the fun, uh, an issue which I think is very fundamental for our time. This is the issue of bushmeat. Okay, So all throughout the world, uh, in Central Africa and other parts of the tropical world, Southeast Asia, people hunt uh, and have contact with these animals. We work a lot with these people for our studies. Um, and, and I think what's happened, um, I, I mean, I'd just like you to sort of obviously, when you look at this picture, you're going to have certain kinds of feelings. Um, and clearly, I think this is one of the primary crises in our, in our period of time in humanity. And sort of when your children and grandchildren ask you questions about this time, they will ask you qu uh, questions about this sort of activity. They're going to say, how was it the case that you let some of our closest living relatives, some of the most valuable endangered species on the planet, go extinct under your watch? Okay? But part of the point of our research is they're not only going to ask you that question, and that's the question that this picture probably elicits for you. They're going to also ask you the question is that when you knew that these were the sorts of activities that seeded pandemics like HIV, how did you still allow those activities to go on? And it's actually going to go one step beyond that. They're going to say, how in times of potential food security did you recognize that these were not sustainable sources of animal protein that much of the world's population relied on that you, you actually allow these activities to continue to take place. So I think this transcends the sort of conservation crisis that this picture probably initially elicits for you. Okay? But they're going to ask you another set of questions, which I think is equally important. And just to point out, this is the individual who hunted that monkey from the last picture. They're gonna, look at this individual here. You know, this is just to get a sense of this person. They're also going to ask you a critical question, which is why was it the case that you thought the responsibility for these things rested with somebody like that? Okay? I mean, often what we're looking at in this particular set of activities is individuals who are incredibly poor. I mean, this cannot be this person's this fault, right? Okay? These, are, these are phenomena which have major population-level consequences. But for any one individual, the consequences are not necessarily very high. 
We go into these villages and we say to people, you, you know, we don't think you should be hunting. And they say, well, we've been hunting for ages. Our parents have been hunting. What are you, crazy that you think we're going to get some sort of disease with hunting? And the point is, the risk may not be high for an individual, but when you aggregate millions of individuals that are doing these things, right, one person hunting is not going to make a monkey go endangered. It's not going to lead to a food security crisis, and it's not going to seed a pandemic. But when you have millions of individuals doing this, that's going to seed all of those sorts of things. Okay? And so... Um, I mean, I, I, this is just my sort of side pitch for taking seriously development in rural areas and looking for alternative sources of animal protein. Okay, so now getting back to the sort of major focus of my work, which is understanding how pandemics are born. Um, so about uh, 12 years ago, as a postdoctoral fellow, I started this research, and I was sort of... Um, Picked, I'd been doing work in Malaysia and Borneo for years, looking at the interface between orangutan and human populations, studying malaria and things like that. And I was picked to sort of do this project in Central Africa. This is Cameroon. Uh, I was a bit naive scientifically at the time. I said, okay, no problem. We'll pick these 17 sites. It'll be very straightforward. Um, we'll get wonderful specimens from all of them. Um, so... Um, no need to even go into detail on this, but this, this, is what, this is what the work sort of feels like. It is, our idea is really to get out into some of the most biodiverse regions on the planet, the point where humans really have interfaced with the, sort of these viral hot spots with all these different animals and to follow what's going on in those locations. Fortunately, I have a wonderful group of uh, partners and staff which really allow us to be able to really conduct this work. Uh, without this sort of team, obviously you can't you know, really... You can't really do this work. Um, and now just to give you a little bit of a sense of the, of the work, um, I'll show you a little bit of sort of before and after shots. This is our laboratory in Cameroon. This is what it looks like, looked like before. Um, this is what it looks like now. Before, we, uh, we have all sorts of logistical problems. We have to get high-quality specimens from the end of roads. We have to get them sort of uh, to our urban areas. We have to package them, ship them, keep them cold. So we often have to use dry ice. In order to get dry ice, we have to go to breweries at the beginning of this project, right? And it's not, you, if you try to imagine working in you know, a place like Congo or Central Africa and trying to convince people at a brewery to let you take dry ice, you can imagine the difficulties. Now we have a liquid nitrogen generator. Um, I joke that we have the, sort of the, the, we have the coldest place in Central Africa, which is probably the case. One day we're going to um, make an ice skating rink out of somebody's pool with this sort of stuff. And if any of you come visit, I promise to do that. Um, this is a before shot of me. This is with Colonel Mpudi Ngole, which who's a, a, a health-oriented medical colonel like Walter Reed equivalent uh, in Cameroon who helped us with our research. So this is the before shot. No comment on that one. Um, I'm the one second, second to the right there. Um, Okay, so what we did is we went out and we got to the end of the road. We enrolled individuals who had high levels ex of exposure to animals, people hunting and butchering. We collected blood from those people. We had them collect, collect specimens from animals. We collected intensive behavioral data. And what we, we found is that in addition to collecting a large number of specimens, we can actually document these new viral jumps. Okay, and this is something we didn't realize at the time. You can actually do this work. And... In the process of it, we identified a range of new viruses, including new retroviruses. Okay, and from my perspective, if there are retroviruses which are unknown, which are entering into and spreading into the human population, we need to know about these. Okay, we need to know about a whole range of viruses that are entering into human populations. But at the very least, the things that we know can go on to cause major pandemics like HIV, the fact that these things exist in these populations and we don't know about them, that is a major deficit and our ability to, to be able to prevent pandemics and really address sort of the kind of threats that are really profoundly important, I think, to all of you folks and to everybody in our country and in the world. Uh, and this is just to show you some of the new viruses that we discovered, HTLV3 and HTLV4. Um, for those of you who know anything, uh, who know something substantive about the history of HIV, when it was first identified, it was actually called HTLV3. Okay, and that was before we knew that it was a slightly different group of virus. So these viruses that we've identified are very closely related to HIV. Okay? And frankly, we still don't know if they're spreading and to what extent they're causing disease. We're now in the midst of doing those studies. Okay? And this is really the tip of the iceberg. 
Okay, this is this was what I've described up till now is the work of a small number of scientists that go out to look in one particular part of the world. Okay, but effectively, from our perspective, the most exciting thing is that we demonstrated, you know, that it was really possible to do this work. Now, I, I, I think I probably don't have to emphasize, but it's important to to, to point out that our world is increasingly interconnected. I, I like to refer to this as the connectivity revolution, right? We think about the agriculture revolution and the population explosion. Obviously, it's very important that we have 6 billion people on the planet. That's substantive. We all think about that. But there's 10 trillion ants on the planet, okay? So why is it so significant, the sort of demographic situation we have in human populations? It's not just the population density. It's the level of interconnectedness, okay? Um, you know, I think, again, this slide sort of goes, it, it speaks for itself. We live in an unprecedented period in the history of vertebrates that live on land. Ever since you started having vertebrates on land, there has never been a point in time when biological species were so completely interconnected that we could move from one part of the world to the another part of the world within seconds. I mean, this is creating an incredible viral mixing pot of humanity where we're picking up viruses from all parts of the world. And this is, for me, it's no mystery. I mean, it's hard from moment to moment to see it. We have this, so for a moment, there'll be disease du jour is what I call it. So for a moment, we'll be focused on bird flu. The point is, if we could view this slightly, from a slightly more long-term perspective, what we would see is we're in this, this period of a massive viral storm of outbreaks. There is a constant sort of entry of these new viruses into humanity. And whether it's bird flu or SARS or a new retrovirus or a new herpes virus, there will be viral pandemics on this planet. And what we need desperately to do is to move to a situation where we're capable of understanding these things and sort of move to this preventative model to global medicine. And I really do think we're sort of in this exciting period where we're at the period where I sort of think of it as a dawning of a planetary immune system. So if you kind of think about the internet, some people have referred to the internet as the beginnings of a global nervous system. And what we need is exactly this sort of thing for an immune system. We need a way to monitor the health of humanity and the potential pandemics that we have in such a way that we can catch things early. So once we recognize that it was possible to do this work, that we might be able to sort of create a safety net for human populations, we went to um, <laughs> colleagues at, at, at Google.org and the Skoll Foundation. Uh, and this work, I should point out, was actually seeded by um, NIH. I was awarded a wonderful award called the Pioneer Grant, which was which some years before and permitted some of the Cameroon work. Um, but once we realized it was possible, we knew that we needed another scale of resources. Um, and in order to sort of begin that process, we went to Google and Skoll, and they gave us a uh, million dollars. I mean, this is work that needs $100 million in order to do properly, if not more. But this is a good start. So what we've done now is we've begun to expand from our work in Cameroon to include sites in Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as work in China and Malaysia. And the basic idea is just to extend this work to work in all of these locations, um, studying individuals who have high levels of exposure to animals. And it's not just going to be hunters, right? I've been talking to you about hunters in Central Africa. But there will be a range of populations who are at this interface. But here's, I mean, so there's quite a bit of sort of troubling news, I think, in this talk. But there's also some good news from my perspective. Some of the good news is this. We live in an increasingly specialized world. So it's actually a very small percentage of the human population which is, a, which is associated with the vast, vast majority of contact with wild animal species. For those of you who might not know, this is a wet market, a live animal market from China. Okay? And this is a, a civet, which is sold as a live animal in these markets. And this is exactly how SARS entered into the human population. Okay? But the point is, because there's only a small percentage of us that's really associated with most of this contact with animals, we can get them under surveillance. We can monitor these individuals. We can also try to change their behavior if we come up with reasonable alternatives. Okay, so these are things that we don't have to feel helpless about these pandemics, right? We're not going to control the level of, of sort of air connectivity and boat connectivity of human populations. We are a vastly interconnected species. We're not going to cut down on blood transfusions, okay, which, but we can make them more safe. Okay, we can change injection drug use. All these things connect us as a population and influence the way that viruses are moving about. But what we can do is get these populations under surveillance. And this is sort of what we see as the future of this initiative. We think this is something that should be in viral hotspots everywhere throughout the world. And we think that we can get a substantive enough percentage 
of the global human population who is highly exposed to animals so that we can actually be catching these things. And fortunately, we live in a time where we have absolutely novel techniques where for the first time we can actually study these things as they're entering into human populations. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing, um, one of the, often we work in places that are incredibly difficult. Democratic Republic of Congo, as many of you know, is a country uh, almost the size of Western Europe. In terms, I mean, it's a massive geographic entity. There's only 300 kilometers of roads, you know, 200 and something miles of roads in that entire country. So what we're doing is we're actually taking advantage of boats to set up epidemiological work, to do the surveillance, and to, to capture hunters living along rivers. And we're about to do an expedition uh, just coming up which will allow us to do this. The techniques which exist at this point in time radically change the way that we can study life on this planet. So if, you, if, if an extraterrestri intelligent extraterrestrial landed here and one was tasked with doing an encyclopedia of life uh, on this planet, you know, you think to yourself for a moment what you think they would be studying. You may be thinking plants and insects. <laughs> the reality is the vast majority of life on this planet is microbial. Okay, believe it or not, most mass on the planet is microbes, bacteria, archaea, and viruses. They're the most numerous forms of life. The vast majority of genetic diversity exists in these organisms. By chance of our own particular situations, we're sort of parochial based on our size, how long we live, the fact that we live on the surface of the planet as opposed to in the ocean or underneath the ground. We look at life in a very particular way, but the dominant forms of life that we have right now are microbial. And we now have a range of new molecular techniques which allow us for the first time in history to actually be able to study these things in detail. Historically, you needed to culture every microorganism. Okay, so if I do this and tell you that just on my finger, the, vi the viruses and microbes and bacteria that I picked up number in the thousands. If I have to culture each and one, every one of those, I'm never going to understand that. Okay, but the potential gain to understanding this has radical consequences, okay? And I, you know, obviously, one of the low-lying fruits is helping us to understand and predict pandemics, but there's a whole range of other applications from studying the microbial world when it comes to viruses and other things that cause cancer, right? Human pap cervical cancer, disaster, until you find out that it's mostly caused by human papillomavirus. Then all of a sudden, you can create a vaccine against it. You know, I'm in discussions with NCI right now, National Cancer Institute, to think about how many other cancers are out there that are caused by viruses. Okay, these are things that we can explore in sort of these global networks that we're developing of people throughout the planet. Okay, what about obesity? Another approach to addressing obesity is to heat up the metabolism of all the bugs that live in our guts. Okay, so altering the microbial world has some substantive advantages. These are things that are much easier to manipulate. Right? A vaccine against a virus is something which is addressable. Dealing with cancer is something, human cancer and eukaryotic cells is something that's very challenging. So I, I think in addition to the work with pandemics, sort of we live in this golden age of biology, a little bit similar to the way that people like Darwin and Wallace were in the 19th century, where they still had many, many things to explore. Fine, we're not going to find new primates. Maybe there's a new primate somewhere in the forests of, of northern Vietnam. Okay, but there's a vast unknown world out there that has tremendous consequences for human health and disease and maybe other aspects like climate change. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun with that. Um, um, I sort of, uh, I took a, a pretty radical leap. I was so devoted to this work. I did something which academics really never do, which is I left a tenured full professorship at UCLA to take a great job at Stanford, but mostly to run this organization, the Global Viral Forecasting Initiative, because I think it's that important. And so I spend, uh, fortunately, all of my time working on this. Um, if you have any questions or are interested in it, you can, you can have a look at our website. And I'm certainly, I think we have another 10, 15 minutes uh, for questions. And it uh, seems like, an, uh, obviously, a very important and interesting crowd. But I can tell people are sort of paying attention. So I imagine you'll have interesting questions. And I'm happy to answer them. So thanks. Well, what do you envision what you need? Okay. 
Um, I mean, mostly, the reality is mostly what we need is fuel to be able to set up more sites in more places in the world. I mean, we've got the model down. But I will, one thing I will say is that the revolutions in genomics that people like Francis Collins you know, led in his role at NIH um, have transformed our ability to do this science. And I'm happy to talk about it. I know this is everyone's interested in science. But there are two techniques that are, are of primary importance. And I'll talk about one of them is called viral microarrays. I won't talk about that one. The most exciting is sort of what we think of as shotgun sequencing. Okay, and direct sequencing. Uh, as you all know, there's an incredible revolution in sequencing power. Some people think that we may catch on with sequencing power with, as with Moore's Law, which predicts sort of the increased computing power we have every year. What we find is that the cost and ability to do sequencing of biological materials is dropping in a very dramatic way, and the technology for doing sequencing is increasing. Okay? And for what that means, that means g- genome projects, but one of the things that people are now thinking about is the microbiome. Okay, so in addition to the genome, you have, so right now as I'm standing here, there are a certain number of genes in my body, but they're well outnumbered by the number of microbial genes. Okay, so so only 10% of the cells in any of our body, it's not unique to me, (laughs) only 10% of the cells in your body are actually human cells. The other 90% are bacterial cells. Now, they're smaller cells, okay, and that doesn't even include viruses. Less than 1% of the genetic information on board is human genetic information. The other 99% of that genetic information belongs to the microbes that are part of these sort of ecosystems that we really are, that we represent. And these techniques, things like shotgun sequencing um, and, and with direct amplification PCR is the technical terminology for shotgun sequencing, and these new technologies, things like 454, um, which is, the, it, they're changing all the time. Uh, but there's a whole range of new sequencing technologies which allow us to take the specimen like this, take a drop of blood, put it into one of these, you know, after substantive manipulation, put it into one of these machines, and then sp- it spits out, you know, billions of, um, of, of sequenced, you know, bits of sequence data, A's, T's, C's, and G's, that we, we then can study to try to understand exactly what are the microbial constituents of, that spe- of those things. And so that sort of work that's come out of all that gen- genomic science changes the way that we can look at our own microbiomes, if you will, our own microbial diversity, as well as the diversity in other animals and around the planet. So we depend on that. Um, but it's a perfect point in time for this kind of work. Yep. What, what is your relationship with the CDC? Like, are, are there sites that you can basically, you know, kind of piggyback on and, and see that you're able to, to you know, spread a little bit more and, and do some resources that are already there? Absolutely. Yeah, we work really closely with CDC, have since the beginning of this project. Uh, folks like Lonnie King and Scott Dowell, who are doing really important work. This is sort of, um, God, you know, the, the alphabet soup over at CDC is a little bit complicated. But both of them are involved in sort of global disease detection. I think uh, Scott Dowell's program is global disease detection, and Lonnie King is head of sort of zoonotic and but his he Lonnie King's the head of the group that includes special pathogens the their big P4 lab and all that uh, and we're very much coordinated with them and I think yes the idea is that um, both CDC as well as DOD uh, these DOD international labs are phenomenal like the Namru lab um, the Namru labs in Indonesia and Peru and the laboratories in Egypt so yes all of these things are sort of are fundamental, and we coordinate closely. We're a member of the WHO's Global Outbreak and Alert Response Network, this GORN. Um, you, you know, and I, but the reality is most of those organizations are sort of struggling under, I mean, PEPFAR, wonderful program. You know, I mean, I have nothing but positive things to say about PEPFAR. Well, I mean, if you push me hard, but generally PEPFAR, great program. But what it's done is it's, it's, all these fo- folks are, you know, very much focused on something which is already spread. Okay, so I do think sort of going in and, and coordinating between the work we're doing and what they're doing, and 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 sort of increased resources to be able to focus on future pandemic. I mean, it's a threat mentality. We have that threat mentality in so many parts of the way that we deal with things. 
Um, but for some reason, we have a very responsive approach to infection, or have had that. I do sense that there is a sea change. You know, this is, this is not sort of me alone. I do, I mean, we have a particular approach to doing this, which obviously we think is the most intuitive way to doing it. But there is this change which is occurring. USAID is beginning to get involved in these activities. And, um, and I think maybe one sort of rational approach, and this has happened a little bit at USAID, is that the you know moving from the perspective of just focusing on AIPI, you know the sort of H5N1 bird flu, okay. Not to say that that's not important, and I still like. For me, I, my recommendation is ignore the media, right? When they said it was a huge risk, it was this risk. When they say now it's no risk, it's the same risk, okay. So it's flu is important. There will be pandemic influenza in our lifetime. Okay, whether it's this particular strain which is spreading around the world in birds or not remains to be seen. But if not, it'll be something else. But the point is, there's a much more generic way of studying these things. Okay, because flu is the same thing. It's, an, it's a bird disease that creeps over into humans. Just like HIV was a chimp disease that came over into humans. And SARS was a bat disease. And Ebola is a bat disease. And you pick a disease, and I'll tell you where we think it comes from. Or we're looking for where it comes from. Okay, so... So, so you can, we can be more generic. We can be smart about this and not just respond to sort of media excitement about flu because it hits six chickens and kills. No, I mean, I, I, we have to pay attention every, you know, but it's, people die from infectious diseases all the time. What we want is the things that could potentially be devastating for the human population. Yes? Uh, I think it's very, very important to what you are. But uh, obviously the key question there is immune. Immune reaction. I mean, the reason why you have all these bacteria and viruses that are still alive is because you have developed a good relationship with them. Mm-hmm. And when Europeans came this way, the Native Americans were wiped out. And the reason was not that there was it's not only the spread, but that they weren't preferred. There was no immune reaction against these germs that were. Um, so how would you put the balance between the, the spread of the, of the disease and the trying to develop or encourage? Uh, the organisms to develop the immune <coughs> reaction against them, which in modern society has actually gone the other way around. Our kids are less and less exposed to, to uh, these germs, and therefore they develop all sorts of problems. I mean, my own particular take is that if we, um, I mean, NIH has produced some absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal science and fundamental breakthroughs. Okay, but if you look at the way that science has been encouraged, NSF is a little bit different, but the way that science has, has progressed is there's a tremendous focus towards reductionist science. Okay? My general take is, relative to other things, we know a lot about development of vaccines. We know a lot about the development of drugs. We know a lot about the detailed cell-based interaction between microorganisms and human cancer and humans. What we, what we have not been as strong with is understanding the global distribution. Look at Fogarty International Center within NIH. Okay? These are global phenomena. And these things, we pick these things up. HIV is African. SARS and flu are China. You know, are China. Fogarty International Center is like a pittance of, of, of funding that goes to NIH right now. So I, I think that, you know, and this happens naturally, right? So what happened, this is how I view it. Sort of 19th century... We, late 19th century, early 20th century, we discovered most of the big things on this planet. People said, okay, we can't discover much anymore. So we started saying, let's bring it into the lab. Let's see how do we manipulate it. Let's go down to a lower level. And that's had huge consequences. But now we've sort of come full circle. And these techniques will allow us to understand a much vaster unknown world around us. Okay, so global field biology, which is really not, nobody's encouraged. Kids are not encouraged to, to be field biologists. Okay, but there's a tremendous need for this kind of science, and the tools now exist to do this work. So I do think you know, diagnostics are key, vaccines are key, understanding the immune system is key, but it seems to me, from my own perspective, we're already you know, sort of the, the, um, you know, nine, you know, we're the kind of the skinny person with huge biceps in that particular realm. You know, what we need to be is fully rounded, and that means understanding the nature of these things, not only the small percentage of them that we study in the lab and the little lab situations, but exactly what goes on in the field and, and the diversity of things out there. Yes, I'll just sort of work around. So, sort of a general question, I mean, going forward and as you progress with this work, how does the political situation in these different places impact? Because most, if not all, of those circles are hot spots 
with respect to the politics. Now, yeah. now you're the more policy and talking more about security and you know, the, the ethnic, ethnic clashes in yep. Middle East, Central Africa, and Central Asia. So, I mean, I presume you will face a substantial number of security issues with respect to foreign policy, maybe not. Oh, well, I'll address. Uh, so, security as well as diplomacy. I mean, I look, I probably sound like a scientist to you. But often on a day-to-day basis, I feel like a diplomat. You know, I have to, so I work in China, right? And we were able to, we now have this wonderful relationship with China where we have people embedded on the ground. We're working together to study places like wet markets. I mean, all of you know sort of the sensitivity of places like China or Indonesia on this kind of work. And we've had tremendous success working in these places. And the answer to it, how do we do it? It's very, very simple. We go in and we find excellent local scientists we engage them. We don't say the biggest issue is to move a specimen here. No, that's not, that's not our first priority. Our priority is to get the right specimens. You know, it's not sort of this extractive science. We're going to take specimens. We're going to send it to this lab or that lab. It's really about we need to understand the biology, this interface between humans and animals. Once we get the specimens, by that time, we're already scientific colleagues with these people. We've eaten with them. We know their kids. We, we, and then it's just a matter of, look, you deal with we can think about how to move specimens around. It depends on what's logical. And at that point, people have invested in collecting these specimens and engaging in the science. From a security perspective, um, it's a variable I can't address. I mean, if you folks can all make the world more secure, that would make life easier for my work. But in the meantime, we just do what we do. And um, obviously, we try to take it into account. The biggest risks are things like um, the biggest ways for, for us and our team to be safe is wear seatbelts. You know, I've been infected with malaria three times, so it's, you know, take my malaria drugs and, and things like that. But, I mean, they're important concerns, but I think, I think a lot of things are surmountable. People think about the Indonesian response to flu, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but there was a desire to get isolates of influenza from Indonesia to help um, in this process of creating the seasonal vaccine, which is done every year. And Indonesia sort of was resisted. They said, this is valuable local property. And... And there was, the response was sort of this stalemate between WHO and international organizations in Indonesia. Um, you know, and I can't comment on this, and obviously my colleagues at WHO are, are excellent, but part of what needs to happen is we need to sort of be willing to negotiate. My take on Indonesia, having lived in that part of the world, was that was a bit of a negotiation gambit. You know, the response, it, it, the response shouldn't have been like, oh my God, you're asking for something to give flu specimens. That's not doable. It's like, okay, well, no, we can't give you what you want, but... You know, how about we collaborate on something? Anyway, that sort of would be my approach. And I think part of it is the importance of things like the C- these DOD overseas labs like NAMRU and in Indonesia. You know, when I hear people saying that they want to close down that, that lab or that there's even, you know, concerns about that lab, because it is hard to do work in Indonesia right now. I'm like, that lab has existed since the 60s and 70s. It is like an incredible outpost that we as Americans have to understand these things. The notion that because of some blip in a particular health minister that we would consider changing the, you know, devoting resources to, to what really is a jewel in our sort of national public health system seems to me to be create, you know, just create lunatic. Like when we closed the lab, we closed one of those DOD labs in Brazil, and I just, I still don't understand that. Um, anyway, I'm sorry. Yes? Sorry. Right, well, first I want to thank you for, uh, for coming and presenting the, your, your information in a format that is very easy to understand. Of all of the speakers that I've been to, never encountered uh, such a presentation with such energy and vitality. Now to my uh, question, what to, how do we translate your work into public policy? How do we, as, as, as a member of Congress, how can I, I'm, we're, I'm fascinated by, by the work that you do, but how do I translate it into public policy when here in Congress, we deal with decisions, uh, making funding decisions in, in terms of how to handle the next pan- pandemic when it comes to the United States. Is it a military response? Is it a public health response? How do we ensure from a planning perspective and from a congressional perspective that our, that our constituents are going to be protected? What would be the kind of protocol that you would envision that we need to have in terms of a response here in the United States. Uh, sir, let me first of all thank you for your kind comments. I'm very appreciative. Um, and secondly, 
I, I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but first of all, what I'm happy to do, and this is for any of you, I'm happy to sit down and talk in detail with you and tell you about sort of what I know about what's going on and work with you to try to come to solutions that will be useful. I mean, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, I have plenty of cards and I'm happy to meet with you. My first initial response is that there are some really good systems which exist. You know, for example, um, these DOD overseas labs, I think they're incredible. Um, the CDC, what they're doing, phenomenal. Fogarty Institute definitely needs, from my perspective, more resources relative to what they're getting within NIH right now. Um, if you take a look at, there's the um, global, the GEIS program, G-E-I-S, which is the global, uh, sorry, I'm just a disaster with the alphabet suit, but they're funders of ours. They're the, the um, Global Epidemic uh, Intelligence Service. Uh, it's GEIS within DOD. And it, obviously things like the Biological Threat Reduction Program. Okay, so there are good mechanisms that exist which can be strengthened. Um, and even USAID is starting to get into this. But I do think that there's potential for completely no, new programs, whether it would be existing within HHS or within NIH. You know, that's not my expertise. But I think that what we do need is increasingly sort of massive energy to do this sort of work. But there are platforms that exist to do that. You know, and I, I, w I would be wrong to sort of say that I had expertise in, in doing the sort of complicated work that you folks all do in you know, translating sort of ideas and needs into actual government action, which I recognize is, in, you know, with my dealings with the government, a, a complicated thing. But um, I do think it's doable. I think there's good infrastructure that exists. Whether there's new infrastructure that needs to happen, I don't know. But I'm happy to, and would love to be a part of that active dialogue. Um, but, but I do think that we neglect these issues at our, at our own peril. I do think that we exist at a period where the way that we are connected invites the perfect storm for viruses entering into our human population. This is not something which is over. You know, we cannot sort of say, OK, HIV, now we have cocktails of drugs that deal with them. No. There will be other HIVs and other flus. We don't know what they're going to look like. They're coming. Okay? And it may be two years, and it may be five years, and maybe 10 years. But it's not going to be 20 and 50 years. Um, but we do have the tools necessary to do that, and I do think that um, U.S. government has made you know, some really notable good efforts in that direction. Um, but I do think that I would certainly encourage you to, to push them forward, and I'm happy to be a part of that process. Thank you for the question. Yes? So, so I have a, a more of a kind of pox virus question. Yeah. The pox virus vaccines are usually good at getting cross neutralization. Yeah. As the global as the global immunity to the smallpox vaccine kind of wanes, are you seeing more monkeypox? Oh, no, absolutely. Are you seeing a resurgence of that in Africa? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, we actually, we actually clearly see uh, in Congo increase in monkeypox, and we're still sort of studying this, but you should, it'll be coming out at some point soon. But um, what appears to be exactly what you've suggested, that as, you know, so people around the world were vaccinated against smallpox. Fortunately, the smallpox vaccine covers other closely related viruses. This is one of the good luck things about some, about some of these vaccines. But once we eradicated smallpox, we were like, oh, OK. And then what happened is we stopped vaccinating individuals. So what that means is as individuals are getting older and older, there's a larger population which is susceptible to viruses like monkeypox. And frankly, believe it or not, we still don't even know the origin of smallpox. We don't know where smallpox came from. Okay, but it clearly came from an animal. And this is something we're looking for. And we know there's some clues that we have, like camels get infected with similar virus, but it's not from camels. Almost all these viruses are rodent viruses. That's true. I mean, vaccine, vaccinia, right. I mean, it, it's, it is not cowpox in its traditional sense, but it's, it's, it, even cowpox is probably, most of the things that are, we know of from domestic animals, it's just because we study domestic animals more. Okay, there's so many animals out there that, it, so for example, flu, many flu strains, come from pigs, okay? But it's not that they originally come from pigs. What happens is the pigs have similar, they're mammals like us. So they have a similar sort of physiology. And what that happens is, is they're interacting with ducks and farms. And so flu viruses are bird viruses, okay? But what happens is that pigs can act as mixing vessels for these viruses before they enter into humans. Similarly, that slide I showed of civets. 
Okay, so we originally wrongly attributed civets to be the origin of SARS. We said civets are the origin of SARS. No, in fact, they're not. It's bats. Okay, but what happens is the virus went from bats to civets, and because people eat civets and they exist in farms and they exist in, in markets, it entered into civets, it spread in civets, and it was from civets that it entered into human populations. Okay, and we need to sort of capture that whole thing. And there is, there is increasingly a movement which says people that focus just on human health, that's not going to capture these things. And frankly, people that just focus on animal health, that's not going to capture. What we need is integrated systems that cross over between veterinary science and public health and capture domestic animals and wild animals are completely, wild animals are dying off all over the world all the time, naturally. We don't know when animal die-offs occur. I mean, if you really wanted a, an effective system, we should know when animal die-offs occur. Sometimes when animal die-offs occur, that's right before human outbreaks. This happens in Ebola all the time. In Central Africa, you'll see people will report gorillas finding gorillas dead in the forest. Okay? And this will happen right before an outbreak of Ebola. It happened clearly in yellow fever, as early as the point that sort of Walter Reed and people were working on you know, building the Panama Canal. They would look at howler monkeys. Howler monkeys would die of yellow fever right before outbreaks occurred. Okay? And there are ways that we can do this. We're, for example, we're partnering with this great group called Frontline SMS. And there's a bunch of these groups that are doing crowdsourcing and taking advantage of text messaging. So in the middle of some of these places, the middle of nowhere, I'll be in Congo, there's no electricity, okay? but there's still cell phone service. And you may ask yourself how that occurs. What happens is really amazing. You walk down the street at night, and people will have generators, and they'll be selling for you know, a few francs. You can plug into the generator and charge your phone. But, I mean, but this is leapfrogging potential. Right? I mean, they know what's important, and what they really want is they want communication and access to the outside world. Okay, so there are wonderful trajectories that we can take. Okay, and so our idea is to do sort of this crowdsourcing and gather SMS data from hunters all throughout, so when they see a dead animal, they can report it in. Okay, and there's little impediments, like that individuals wouldn't want to spend a few francs, understandably, that it would cost to send a text message. Even from our perspective, that's not very expensive. So these systems what they do is they set up a computer so if they send in the right sort of message and it fits the right code, instantaneously it'll send credit back to their phone. So that, it, I mean, and there's, there are ways to sort of interface with the IT revolutions that are occurring to allow us to do this surveillance in a smart way and to capture more people. Um, yes. yes. So, uh, leading off that, you said Google is one of your big sponsors. Are you yeah. tapping into their kind of their open source literature? I mean, there are people who track media reports, like the African swine fever outbreak in Georgia. For weeks, there were large, there were reports of an unknown pig disease. Yeah. I mean, if, if you were tracking that, if, if there was a global initiative tracking that, if you would have been on the ground and knew that it was African swine fever long before, just based on these kind of open source reports in the media. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a really exciting time for all of us, because what's happened is there is this sort of, um, you know, very honestly, I mean, Google.org is awesome, and they're totally at the forefront of this sort of thing. But even the resources that they can put in are frankly a pittance as to what will be needed to do this work. But I mean, what, what you, we effectively have right now is this sort of, um, this sort of uh, grassroots movement of people who are trying to do this. You have little cool projects like, say, um, you know, what Google.org is doing, what we're doing, Health Map, the sort of frontline SMS. Uh, so there are little things out there, but the point is to really take these things to scale. Um, but I think a lot of them are scalable. I mean, there's no reason you can't scale following individuals who are highly exposed to animals or using text-based systems to follow animal die-offs or health map, which is this effort to like, you know, or what Google.org is doing. Um, you, you know, but those folks, those folks have been hit, you know. I mean, they don't have the same resources that they had a year ago. I mean, anyway, I don't really yeah. speak at all for Google.org or know what's going on, but I think... Even the resources that, the, the, you know, that they're putting in, um, as sort of forefront as those efforts are, they're a per and, and, and I think they would say the same thing if they were speaking to you. you, you know, these are things that need to be addressed at governmental levels, at international levels, multilateral, bilateral, all these sorts of things. And we're starting to see that. Yes? Um, you, you talked about the role of technology and uh, how you can make more robust international and national resources, agency resources. When you identify any particular country, speaking of governmental, that has been, you mentioned China before, mm -hmm. um, that has made efforts to try to institutionalize some of this, has taken the lead to be a sort of a role model for other countries? That's a good question. 
Um, I think this stuff is, is still pretty early. You, you know, and I think that it's, I mean, we have a challenge where we'll go in like, um, I mean, in some ways, believe it or not, Cameroon, it, it, just, you know, we've been working with them for 10 years, and we've been, we arrived, and everybody was sort of focused on PEPFAR and HIV vaccines, and we did that too. In fact, believe it or not, the way that I came to this work, one of the ways that I came to it was I was, you know, I, I desperately wanted to, an HIV vaccine. And I, and I knew that part of, you know, my expertise is I'm a field virologist. So I wanted to go in the field and prepare sites for HIV vaccines. So I got, you know, I worked with some of these organizations. I got to the field, developed these, you know, phenomenal sites. There was no vaccine to test. You know, waited a year. There was no vaccine to test. Waited another, you know, and eventually I sort of started thinking, and this is not the right approach to this. Um, what are other countries? I think it's new. I think... Um, of the countries that I know. I was encouraging sort of a retail grassroots approach to this comparison. Your collection being one of the biggest issues you have. You know, I mean, I, our approach is very much like find great scientists, local great scientists, engage with them, talk about this, share ideas, hear about what they've got to say, let them sort of work hard in their countries. And we found that places where people said you can't do this, People said, China, you cannot do this work in China. You will never have an MOU. You will never get approval to go into wet markets and sample the interface between humans and animals. Well, we're doing it. <laughs> you know? So it's, it, it's, it is possible, but maybe on some level it is easier for an organization like ours. It, you know, CDC, for example, may have more difficulties in engaging in countries like that on some level. Um, but programs are helpful. Something like PEPFAR an equivalent of PEPFAR that focused on the next HIV, something like that, right? Something that was, because right now we talk to people in you know, places like Cameroon and we say, they, get PEP, they do get PEPFAR. If you want to come in and do HIV-related activities, if you want to increase access to drugs and do diagnostics and even understand surveillance, which is even, frankly, sort of one of the neglected pump components of PEPFAR. You know, surveillance is key. Surveillance is not sort of researchers in some ivory tower trying to like write papers for nature. Surveillance is a fundamental part of understanding how these things move. Okay? And even with HIV, we're not fully getting it. Right? So here's the other thing. I didn't even mention this. Right? HIV is a whole range of different viruses in monkeys and apes all throughout Central Africa. Okay? These things are still entering into human populations. If we're convinced that, the, that, that HIV is only one thing that can enter into human populations, we've had it, and that's it. We know that that's wrong because multiple viruses like this have entered into humans. HIV-2 is a completely different virus from a completely different animal. HIV-1 came from chimps. HIV-2 came from this small monkey in West Africa. Okay? And it spread for a while but didn't go anywhere. But the same conditions that permitted HIV to emerge continue to exist. Okay? And, vi and we're, we're busy looking for them. But I think we'll find evidence of new HIVs that are entering into human populations. And maybe they'll be just different enough so that they won't be captured by our di diagnostics, so that they won't be treatable by our drugs. Okay, so we need, I mean, surveillance and watching for these things is a very key part of this. Otherwise, we're constantly just going to be like, you know, the, the, the game where we're knocking down the gopher, and it'll just pop up somewhere else. Um, anyway. Sure. Yes. If we need young people engaged in the kind of work that you're doing, uh -huh. I would strongly suggest you make a CD that is geared towards high school students that talks about some of the information you have and about how you got to where you were. Get the CDs out to science classes. And we've got to start thinking about how we get our young people engaged. And there are so many activities, so many careers that they're not familiar with. You're in one of them. And until they start to hear about I teach on a university level. Mm -hmm. So I, I just encourage you to think about doing something like that. No, I appreciate that. I'm actually part of what I'll do during this visit is talk to colleagues at National Geographic. And, um, but yeah, I do, th I do think it's important. I think things like, I mean, field biology, people despair as to sort of, the kids love discovery. They love discovering new stuff. I'm like a kid. I get to go out and discover new stuff all the time. That's what I love in my life. And the, the fact is, there are these, so many of these unknown things, and we need teams and teams of field microbiologists, from my perspective, veterinarians, field microbiologists, international health physicians, people who do sort of mapping activity. These are things that are going to be interesting and useful for 
a whole range of things that we don't even know about. Like just, just for example, what about the possibility that we'll find microorganisms that, in, that are, are increased reflectivity? Okay, so you could decrease, you could have albedo bugs, you know, that address climate change, right? I mean, and if you think about biofuels, breaking down cellulose, which is obviously one of the big challenges. Right now we're all focused on corn, which is n neither here nor there. It's not, I mean, it's better than burning fossil fuels, but only barely. Okay, but if we can get microbes to break down cellulose, you know, that's a completely different thing. There's a tremendous amount of biochemical and genetic reserves that are held on this planet, sort of natural resources that are completely underexploited in the microbial world. Um, and this is just one very important, I would argue, example of how understanding that world is going to change, change a lot of things. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>